Good morning. How are you guys? You doing awesome? You know, I was, I was, um, thanks for coming. Oh, it's dark. I can't see any of you. <laughs> um, I'm sure you're beautiful, though. You always are. Um, I, I was thinking this week, um, you know, there's obviously, there's this virus going around, right, that is causing panic. And, um, and, and we're not, I'm not, I'm not making light of the fact that, you know, people are taking precautions and doing stuff like that. I don't think that means that you're foolish or don't have faith or any of that stuff. The last thing we ever want to do is let what we believe cause someone to feel condemned for what they believe. That's the last thing we ever want is to take moral high ground and act like, well, because I believe this, if you don't, there's something wrong with you. And, and that, that, that causes such distaste in people's mouths. Um, and, and, in, and in people's lives that, that, that they may not hear the rest of what you have to say for a long time or ever. So I, I do want to caution our church that, you know, we, we do believe that, that we have a covenant with God that's greater than, than anything in the world. And we do believe that greater is he that is in us than anything that is in the world. But we also want to make sure that as we, as we talk with people and communicate with people, that we make sure that we're not projecting something, even with what we're not saying. Um, but I was thinking this week, I was like, man, they, they finally named the virus, you know, COVID-19, and that, that name is striking fear in people, but I was thinking, man, it's amazing that they named it, because now, like, Jesus was greater, but there's a promise that says he's the name above every other name. And so there's a name now for the thing that Jesus' name is greater than. And it's not like he wasn't greater till they named it, but now we have something that we can say, this is the name, and Jesus, you're above that name. And so... Um, Thanks for coming. I, I want to, uh, this morning I woke up with, with something rolling around and so I, I, I was like, okay, Lord, I had a different message. Maybe that's for next week. But I woke up with, with thinking about, um, in, if you have your Bibles, open up to Numbers um, chapter 6. It's, it's where God is, is talking to Moses and he's telling Moses, I want to bless my people and I, I want you to give this blessing to men to give to my people. And we call it the, the, the blessing of Aaron, but it's, it's the blessing of God. Uh, Aaron and his sons, the priests of the time, were the delivery vessel for this blessing, but it's not Aaron's blessing, it's the Lord's blessing to his people. And, and I believe it's still his heart to his people because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I wanted to talk about that, just can't, kind of in light of everything that's going on, but, but more than that, just because I feel like right now is a great time to be able to believe and declare things that are true. When there's so many things that are being declared that cause panic and fear, things, sometimes things are being blown out of proportion or, or, or things that are just not true are being said to strike fear in people. And, and, and so I, I feel like this is so appropriate for this morning. And we don't often preach in reaction to what's going on. Um, and so I don't feel like this is in reaction to what's going on, but I feel like it's just the Lord saying like, hey, just don't forget my heart. In the middle of everything you're hearing, don't forget what I've already said. Don't forget that long before this came, I already spoke and declared who I am and who I want to be for my people. So in Numbers chapter six, uh, verse 22, it says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and to his sons saying, thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel and then I will bless them. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that, that, that it's alive, God, that it's not just writing on a page. It's not just sterile words in a book that we read and put on the shelf and say we've done it. God, that we open your word and we find you. God, we find ourselves. We see who you are, God. We see who you've called us to be. We see who you've said your desire and your heart is to be for us, God. And so I thank you that as we, as we open your word and we, we echo words, God, that you spoke God, that you physically spoke to a man thousands of years ago, but you knew they would be recorded and that today, God, we would open our mouths and we would say the very words that came from your mouth many, many years ago, God, that they're just as alive and that your breath is just as on them today and your heart is just as behind it and your desire is just as for it today, God, as it has ever been. What an amazing thing. And God, that as we, as we, as we read and teach from your word, that, that your spirit would breathe on it. God, it's, it's revelation that changes us. 
It's the anointing that breaks chains. It's your presence, God, that makes everything. And so, Father, would, would, you, would you breathe on these words of yours? Would our ears be open to hear and our minds open to, to receive and to understand in our hearts, God, that, that we would be that good soil, God, that, that we would have those hearts that your word would go deep into, God, and it would spring up and produce fruit, God, that a world that's dying and doesn't know you would taste the fruit of our lives, God, and see that you're good. In Jesus' name, amen. So God... <clears throat> comes to Moses, and remember we talked a few weeks ago about Ezekiel, and we talked about this thing where it's like God has something in his heart that he wants to do, but then he finds a man, and he says, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I want to do, but, but I want you to play a part in this, Ezekiel. I, I'm, I'm going to put sinew and skin and flesh on these bones, and I'm going to put my breath into them, and I'm going to cause them to rise up an exceedingly great army. But Ezekiel, I want you to declare what I'm showing you that I want to do. And we talked about that, how, how God said, okay, Ezekiel, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to ask you a question. And, and how many of you know, like, that's the greatest answer you can give God if you don't know what the answer is. It's like, oh, Lord, you know. He says, Ezekiel, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, oh, Lord, you know. Like, if, if, listen, don't feel like you having everything figured out or not having everything figured out will keep God from sharing his heart with you. Like, he's okay with someone saying, you know. It's obvious because the next thing he does is reveal his heart to Ezekiel. He's not offended. He doesn't say Ezekiel. Obviously, if I'm asking you a question, the answer is yes. Like, he's not that way. Like, sometimes we have this idea of him being this, like, a dictator almost, or like, like every little thing that we do right or wrong, that everything hinges on that, and we're, we're almost, like, uh, I don't know why, I'm fearful. And it's like the Lord is just asking, can these bones live? And all he's looking for is someone that looks at them and doesn't say no. He was okay with any other answer but no. He's okay with you saying, I don't know. He's just not okay with you. Like he comes to, to, to Zechariah and he comes to Mary with the same word. You are going to have a son at a time when you're too old and you're too young and you've stopped doing the thing that's necessary and you haven't done the thing that's necessary. He gives the same word to both of them that they're going to bring forth sons. And one person says, Lord, how could this happen? He's okay with her not saying, yes, Lord, it's going to happen. I believe it. Shundalahaya. He's okay with that. He says, she says, how, how will this happen, Lord? In other words, like, okay, I hear what you're saying. I can't really understand how. But let it be unto me as you've said. Like, Lord, I believe you can. I, what I'm struggling with is not whether you can or whether you will. God, what, what my mind can't get around is the how. He's okay with that. But Zechariah doesn't have that same. He, he answers almost the same. But there's no nevertheless and to Mary, he says, Mary, you're blessed among all the women in the earth. And to Zechariah, he says, I don't want another word coming from your mouth until the baby's born. I don't want you to curse the thing that I'm giving life to. And, and it's okay that Ezekiel doesn't know how it will happen. Listen, like when the Lord starts speaking to you about something, don't feel like you have to have everything figured out and that it coming to pass has, ha, hinges on you having the, the, the how and the why and the what figured out. But don't ever let yourself get to a place where you look at the valley of the dry bones and the Lord is saying, can they live? And you tell him no. Don't look at the, at, at the situation in your life that the Lord is wanting to breathe on, that he's wanting to, like he doesn't tell Ezekiel what he's going to do and what his heart is until Ezekiel is in a place where he says, at least he doesn't say no. Like when you get to the place where in your mind you've closed off the chance that God could do something, like that's where you don't want to be. And it's okay to say, I, I don't know. Like that's a whole lot better than looking at it and saying, no, they can't. But the amazing thing about it is, is he says, Ezekiel, this is what I'm going to do. Like at that point, is there any question that God's heart is to see the bones become fully formed human beings with the breath of life in them? Is there any doubt? No, why? Because God's declared what his heart is. It's not cryptic. But then he says, now Ezekiel, I want you to believe that. 
and then I want you to speak it. And when you speak it, the very first time, you may not see every bit of it come to pass. Because Ezekiel declares what God says, and everything happens except for the most important part, and that is the breath of life coming inside of them. And, and, and so many times I think we hear the word, the word of the Lord, we hear his voice, and we declare in faith what God is saying, and then we look, and maybe something's changed, but, but, it's, but it's not exactly what God said, and don't be okay, and don't be content until you see fully what he's promised. Like, don't be content with the fact that it looks better than bones. Don't stop there. Don't say, well, it's better than it was. At least instead of bones, they look like human beings. It's no longer a ghastly, disgusting, scary sight. It just looks like, no, don't be okay with just better than it was. Like, don't stop there. Not when his heart has been, I'm going to put the breath of life in them and I'm going to make them rise up and they're going to be an exceedingly great army. Don't be okay with a bunch of mannequins when God has promised an army. Don't be okay with things that look better than they were but still have no ability beyond the bones. Like he doesn't just want things to be better than they were. He wants them to be exactly what he said they would be. You have to believe that though, because there'll be times in your life where God will show you and tell you what he wants and you will not be able to see it with your eyes, but you have to believe it to the point that when you speak what he says and you don't immediately see it, you don't walk away and say, well, it's better than it was. You actually listen for the next voice of the Lord. When we talked about that a little while ago about Abraham and Isaac, and we're like, man, how many Isaacs had died on the altar because people had one word from God and ran with that rather than listening for the next word that proceeded from his mouth? How many Isaacs have died on the altar because people had one word from the Lord and stopped listening for the next? How many times have Ezekiel's walked out of the valley with things looking better than they were, but not still fully what God desired. He says, now you prophesy to the breath. Come on, it's the thing that he said twice. He said, I'm gonna put my breath in them, I'm gonna put sinew and bone, and I'm gonna raise them up, and I'll bring my, cause my breath to come in. He said twice what his heart was. It's like, man, if there was one thing that Ezekiel was sure of, it was that the, the breath of God was gonna come into these things, because it's the one thing that God repeated. And yet, it's the one thing that doesn't happen the first time Ezekiel speaks. You have to know what his heart is. And you have to trust what he said more than what you see. So that if what you're seeing doesn't line up with what he said, you don't walk away and leave it. You stay in that place. And you keep listening. He'll keep speaking. And then you don't say, well, God, I tried that already. I had no intentions of preaching this stuff, but somebody needs to hear. God, I tried that already. How many dreams, how many relationships, how many uh, uh, circumstances have, have stayed the same, have not been fully what God wanted because somebody heard the Lord, but then when they acted on what he said and they didn't immediately see things come fully to what he said they would come to, they adopted this, this stance of, but God, I already tried that, and it didn't work. I, I used to believe in healing, and then. I, I used to believe in, in, in wonders and signs, but then. And, and, and we fill in the blank with our story of disappointment, and we make the word of God subject to what we've experienced rather than making what we experience subject to the word of God. I'm just telling you right now, like he has clearly stated his heart for things so many times over and over again, and it's not up to us to let our experience dictate whether his heart really is what he said. It's to let his heart dictate what we should be experiencing to the point where if we don't see it the first time, we stand in that place. Just don't, don't walk away just because the first time you declared his heart, you didn't immediately see things change and, and become what he said. You stand there, and you wait for him to speak again. Because if he declared his heart and his will before, like nothing changed. Your lack of experience or, or people's lack of response doesn't change the heart of God. But will we be people that will stand there and look at something and say, God, I know what you said. 
Two times you said you were going to put breath into them. And I did, God, to the best that I know. I said everything you told me to say. God, I did everything that you told me to do. Like, another important thing is don't blame yourself if you don't immediately see it. Like, so many people go into self-condemnation and self-doubt and say, well, I must not have heard God, and walk away thinking, well, I thought he said he was going to put breath in them. But what I see is now changing my mind about what he said. I thought he said he was going to put breath in them, but I did everything he told me to do. I think maybe I didn't hear him right. Maybe it wasn't an army. Maybe he said it's going to be a valley of mannequins. No. Like, if you know you've heard the word of the Lord, know you've heard the word of the Lord to the point that lack of seeing it doesn't change it. But stay there. Stay in that place. Keep listening. Because if it hasn't happened, he's going to tell you what to do. He's going to speak again. He's going to cause the breath to come. He already told you his heart. He already told you what he wanted to do. He already told you what he was going to do. He already told you why he was going to do it. Like you know everything you need to know. The only thing you don't know is, God, what do I do now? Just stay there and don't walk away and don't give up. And he says to Ezekiel, he says, now you prophesy that a man say to the four winds, come, O winds. He didn't say that the first time. Sometimes obedience to the first thing allows us to stand in the place of hearing the next thing. Sometimes not giving up and walking away at the end of the first thing keeps us in the place of being able to hear the second thing. And Ezekiel prophesies again. And suddenly, the army rises up and becomes everything that God declared it would be in the beginning. How many valleys are full of bones because people walked away after the first time and changed their theology, changed what God said, changed what they believed based on what they didn't see versus based on what he said? It's so quiet in here this morning. You guys like holding your breath or something? Like, come on. I know it is. That's why I'm surprised everyone's so quiet, Madison. <laughs> It's not my words. I didn't get up here planning this stuff. Like, even the stuff I planned to say wasn't mine. It was I woke up in the morning with it. But man, I'm just telling you, someone or someones and probably a bunch of people, you need to hear this. Like, just because you did what you were called to do and you didn't see what he said you would see, don't change what you believe about the Lord. Don't change what you believe about what he wants to do. Like, don't look at the, at the mannequins, the lifeless forms. They, they have the, the form, but they don't have the power. Don't look at those places that have the form and lack the power and walk away as though his heart has changed for them. You just continue to be obedient and speak what he's saying and trust that the power comes from him and that he will do what he said he would do. Come on, he will do it. So here's God doing this again. Do you guys, like, like, who is it? Because I can't get off it, and let's just pray for you right now. Who is it? Yeah, who else? Yeah, come on, keep your hands up, because we're going we're gonna to lay hands on you. We're going we're gonna to be the church, and we're going to believe. And what we're going to pray is this, that you would have the courage and the steadfastness to stand in that place and see something that looks kind of like what God said, but not fully what God said, and believe that he will do what he said, and all I have to do is continue to listen because he will tell me what to do next. Come on, who else is it? Anybody else? If it's you, all right, stand up. Stand up where you are. Church, let's be the church. This is one of the basics of the faith, the laying on of hands. It's up to people who believe to actually be believers. So pray with belief, and I'm not even gonna lead in a prayer, but all we're gonna pray for is this, is that, that we would have the wisdom and the courage and the perseverance and the steadfastness to believe that he is who he said and he will do what he said he would do. So Father, thank you for that.
thank you that the things that we've thought were dead are not dead. They're just waiting for the breath of heaven. They're just waiting for the next word. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. <sighs> All right. I tried to move on like four times and I couldn't, so I'm like, okay, Lord. You know, like we all think that we would be quicker than. <laughs> uh, all right. So he comes to Moses and he says, Moses, I have something in my heart that I want you to declare and I, that I want to be, that I, that I want my people to know and that I want to do. But, but, but this is what I need from you, Moses. I need you to believe me. And then I need you to tell this to people who will tell this to people. At the end, that's what he says. He says, then they will do this, and then I will do it. Could God do it if people didn't? I suppose, but not once he says, when you do this, I will do it. Because he's bound by his word, and he exalts his word even above his own name. So when he says, Moses, I'm going to do this upon the speaking of this by my priest, then he's bound to that. And that means he's going to do it, but he needs it to be spoken by his priest. And so he says to them, he says, tell them this, the Lord bless you and keep you. How, how many of you right now could use knowing that the Lord is not only blessing you, he's keeping you? He says the Lord, the first thing he wants them to know, the Lord bless you and keep you. That word bless there is barak, which means to kneel. By implication, it means to bless God as an act of, indir of adoration or vice versa, man as a benefit. He says, I I'm coming to you and it's for your benefit. I I'm coming to you and it's because of who I am, not, not because of what you've done right. I'm coming to you for your benefit. Not because you've done everything right, not because you haven't doubted me, not because you haven't grumbled or complained, not because you wouldn't want to go back to the place that I brought you out of. Like, like so many times we think that this blessing is so conditional on our good behavior. We try to work our way into the blessing of God and God, listen, look, there's blessing in obedience. Don't ever hear me say anything that makes you think that it, we don't believe that. There is certainly blessing in obedience and consequence for disobedience. But when God is talking to his people, he's talking to people that he would say were stiff-necked, rebellious, that he at one point told Moses, I'm just going to kill them all and start over with you and Moses says wait a minute God <laughs> those are those are your people you brought them out here and if you do that the nations of the world will look at you and think this is your character and nature well, here's the thing Moses had to know the character and nature of God to be able to use that to persuade God to not kill him we need people who actually know the character and nature of God so that when a voice rises up and says I'm going to do something you say wait a minute I don't want the world to think this about you because that's not who you are. Yeah. I know who you are. And so, so, so God comes to, to Moses and he says, tell him the Lord bless you and, and keep you. It's, it's the Lord wants to, to come to you, God, and the Lord wants to for your benefit. He wants to bless you. Not because you've done everything right. Not because you are going to be perfect. Not because you're not going to complain about the very thing that you begged for. These are people who literally for 400 years begged for something and then when they got it, complained about it and said we'd rather be back where we begged you to be out of. Like double-minded? Yeah. We begged for 400 years, God. And then when you did it, it didn't look exactly like we thought it should look and it wasn't as easy as we thought it should be. And so now the thing we begged for we're complaining about. Listen, just because it's not as easy as you thought, just because it's not the way you thought it would be, doesn't mean it's not the Lord. Just because you have to face things that you didn't realize you were going to have to face when you were asking him for the thing you asked for. How many of you have been through that, right? Like you ask God for something and then he does it and you're like, no. No, 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 you only heard the first line of my prayer. What about the rest of it? I didn't ask for this and this, and I asked for that and that. And they're like, God, do no. And the Lord's like, just trust me. 
because I'm taking you to a place where all these things that you don't like are actually things that are gonna strengthen you and make you able to obtain the thing that I really want for you, which is better than the thing you asked me for in the beginning. Come on. Come on, all these things that you're walking through, even if they're not things that I ordained and even if they were things that came about because of your foolishness, selfishness, or disobedience, if you'll just trust me, they'll become things that will actually strengthen you and bring you to a place where when I bring you to something better than you ever imagined, you're actually able to, to, uh, to, to see it and to uh, obtain it and to keep it and not let it keep you and not let it destroy you. Like I'm bringing you to a place where you're gonna have to believe me because you're gonna fight giants. If you can't believe me to get food, how are you gonna believe me to kill the people that you don't think you can kill? Like I'm trying to teach you trusting me now in the simple where, where your disobedience only makes you hungry so that I can bring you to a place where I can trust you where if disobedience would, would actually mean that you died. Like. God takes them out of the land of Egypt and he takes them on a roundabout journey and he brings them roundabout to the land that, that he wants them to obtain. But I said, because if I bring them right now to the land of the Philistines, their hearts would fail. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, I care more about you than I do you doing the very thing that I want you to do. Like, I want you to do that thing, but I also don't want your heart to fail. And so if I see that you're in a place right now where if I brought you to the thing I have for you, it would cause your heart to fail and it would harm you, I won't bring you to that yet. I'm still going to bring you there, but I need to take you somewhere first so that you can understand me and know me and trust me so that when you walk into that land, your heart doesn't fail. Like, quit complaining that it's taking longer than you thought it would take. Maybe you're not ready for that thing yet. Quit blaming God for not being there yet when God's saying, shh, you just trust me. I did speak that word over your life. But if I brought you to that place right now, it would harm you. If I brought you to that place right now, you couldn't contain it. If I brought you to that place right now, you wouldn't be able to steward it the way I want you to steward it. So would you just trust me that I still have that for you, but I have some things I need to teach you first. Don't give up and walk away because it doesn't look like what you thought it would look like. Just trust that he's taking you where he said he would take you. <sighs> Y'all are so quiet. Look, I, I, like y'all need more coffee or, <laughs> or maybe it's really just settling in your heart. That's good too. That's good. So he says, that I want to bless you. But then he says, I want to keep you. And that word keep there is a word shamar, which means to hedge about as with thorns. And I was asking the Lord about that. And, and this is what I felt like I heard him say. The hedge is thorny, but it was never meant for the thorns to be a burden or a source of pain for his people. It was meant to guard them and protect them from the enemy. It was meant to keep them in the place of blessing, not keep them from it. God wants his people to know that his blessing includes a hedge of protection because there are forces in the world that would harm you if they could and because there are places that he never meant for you to go. So this, this thorny hedge of protection, he says, I'm going to bless you, and in that place that I bless you, along with the blessing, I'm going to keep you in that place of blessing. I'm going to place a hedge around you, and that hedge has thorns, but I'm telling you, the thorns are not because I want you to experience pain. The thorns are because they're, I don't want you going where I don't want you to go, and I don't want things coming in that were never meant to come in. Just think about it. Like, how many times have we experienced pain because... We've experienced something he had for us, but on the other side of the hedge. Like everything that he's created for us, he's created for us to enjoy in the place of blessing. In the place where he's blessed it. Like intimacy between a man and a woman is an amazing thing that was created by God. But it's supposed to happen within the hedge, within the place that he's blessed. And how many times when we go outside of the hedge does it cause pain and destruction? It leads to things that were never his heart, leads to things that were never his desire for us. The hedge is not to keep you from things, it's to keep you from things outside of the place of his blessing. I hear a leaf blower or something going all of a sudden. <laughs> Like, Lord? <laughs> and I heard a sound like a great rustling wind. <laughs> but it was just a blower. Uh, 
I wrote this down. I, I don't know. You know what I love? I love the fact that I never know who's going to be here and I never know what you're going through because then I can just purely speak the word of God and let it land where it lands. Like when you're speaking to people, like you don't want foreknowledge. You don't want to know what's going on in the room because sometimes knowing what's going on in the room would keep you from actually saying the thing that God wants you to say. I wrote this down. I'm just going to read it. The keeping of God is him saying, I want to bless you. I want to be with you. And then I want to put a hedge around you to keep you safe within that place and make sure that not only does the enemy not get into that place, but also that you don't leave that place so that you experience everything I have for you within the place of blessing. The thorny hedge is not because there's amazing things on the other side that God wants to keep you from. The thorny hedge is because the pain of a poke from a hedge is so much better than the pain that's experienced when we get beyond the hedge and we live outside of his desire for us. Like that pokey hedge is a friend saying, hey, I noticed this in you. You were talking the other day, and I don't even know if you, if you knew this, but you said this, and I started to wonder, man, is there something going on in your heart? That's that poke of the hedge. Of the, it's a friend saying, hey, I, I saw this. And that's not good. It's reading the word and, 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 and the word like cutting and saying, like as, as we read the word, something going, oh, that man is me. It, it, it's, it's a community of people around us that love us enough to speak truth to us even though it stings a little bit in the moment. That's, what, that's the sting of the hedge. It's, it's not this place where, where nothing ever stings, where, where everything feels great and everything is always just butterflies and rainbows. It's, 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 a, it's a hedge around us that actually cares enough about us that says, maybe this stings a little bit, but the sting of feeling this is so much better than the pain if you push past that sting and you go where you're headed. Like, how many things start with something little that could have been avoided if we would have been obedient when we first felt that first sting, that first bit of pain, that first check in our spirit, that first time a friend warned us, that first time the Spirit of God said, don't, no. And, we, and if, we were, if we're honest, like sometimes we're, we don't want to hear that stuff because we want what we want in a moment and we're living selfishly for a moment and we don't realize that, man, this is not to harm you and keep you from something good. This is to keep you in the place of blessing so that yeah, that thing that God put a desire in your heart for is good, but the place that you're going, looking to go get it is not. Like he didn't create you with desires to frustrate you because he's not a frustrating father. That means if he created you with a desire, he has a desire to fulfill it, but there's a way that he wants to fulfill it, and if you go about it other than that way, it's going to bring pain, it's going to bring loss, it's going to bring destruction, and so that hedge is just that stinging thing around us. It's a friend, it's, a, it's our community, it's the word of God, it's the spirit of God, it's, a, it's the, the spirit inside of us, it's our conscience, it's all those things going, no! When you feel that, like the best thing that you can do is run back to the center of the hedge, or the center of the place of blessing. I mean, as far from the hedge as possible, which is in the center of his will. Get as far away from that thing as possible because you understand there was something on the other side of that sting that was far worse than the sting. And I don't want to see how close I can get to the hedge without getting stung. I want to see how close I can be to the center of his will for my life, which is the place of blessing. Mm. Come on, don't avoid that sting. I'm serious, it's there for your protection. It's there to keep you from something that's harmful, not to keep you from something that's amazing. It's to keep the amazing amazing so that when you experience it, you experience it the way and the when that he desires. How many people have come into financial success and it's ruined their life, not because God doesn't want you to be blessed, but because he doesn't want you to go outside of his will for your life to find the blessing. There's a bunch of younger guys in here, so I'm just gonna say this. The desires that you have were put there by the Lord and they have a holy purpose. Don't ever be ashamed of the desire that he's given you for a woman. But don't ever let that desire drive you outside of the hedge to seek it in a place he never called you to find it. 
He wants to keep that pure so that when you experience it, you experience it where and when he desires so that he can bless it. That's his desire. He's not a frustrating father. He didn't create you to fight yourself. He created you to submit yourself to him so that the things he's put in your heart could actually be a blessing to you rather than an internal war. Come on, he's called you to peace. That means even with yourself and your own like, desires that God created you with. You were never created to have a war against yourself for the rest of your life. You were made to submit that desire to him so that he could bless it. And you could experience it not only what, but when and how he designed and created it for. Don't go look for something cheap out there. Get scars and scratches all over your arms in the process. And so here's the thing, is like, there's so many things in life that after you've experienced it the wrong way, you look back and you're like, oh, the right way was so much better. And sometimes you just have to trust that like other people who have been through the hedge, like learn from them so that you don't have to have your own scars and scratches. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. So there in the place of blessing and keeping, the Lord's face is shining. You know what that word shining means? It means to make luminous, to make glorious, but it also means this, to kindle or to set on fire. (laughs) He wants to set you on fire. We think it's our idea. We're like, God, set me on fire. God's like, man, I told Aaron years and years and years ago that I want to set you on fire. I've just been waiting for you to stand in that place so that my face could actually light you up to the point where you're set on fire. You've been so busy messing around with the hedge, you forgot that I wanted to set you on fire and make you blaze so that people could see you, so that people could see me. This is his heart. Like, you're not begging God to do something. He's waiting for you to stand in that place so that he can do it to you. You don't stand there and go, God, set me on fire. Like, that's not what he's responding to. Like, it's, a, it's cool if your heart says that. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is he's not setting you on fire because you came up with an idea and you are talked him into it. Yeah. He's setting you on fire because it's always been his desire to have people that would blaze and burn for him, that he could light up with the joy and the gloriousness of who he is so that they're set on fire, so that you could be the light of the world. Jesus was the light, and he looks at the disciples, and he says, now you're the light of the world. Oh, a city set on a hill. No one puts a, lights a, a, a candle and puts it under a basket. In other words, you weren't lit on fire just so that you could sit in your little room and burn by yourself. You were set on fire so he could put you on a place where everyone could see so that his light would draw men unto himself. Remember that. So his light would draw men unto himself, not unto you and your little candlestick. He doesn't care about the candlestick. He cares about people being drawn to the flame. We're busy making candlesticks and trying to build our own kingdoms. And he's saying, man, I don't, I don't care about the candlestick. The candlestick is a vessel. It's a tool. It's a way. For, it's, it's not the thing. The thing is the flame. The thing is God, the light of the world. The thing is Jesus. It's relationship with the Father. It's intimacy with him. I don't care about the candlestick. That serves a purpose. It's a tool, but it's not the thing. Quit polishing and building the candlestick. Draw people to me. Let that flame be what they want. I don't want them to leave with a t-shirt that says the candlestick's name on it. I want them to leave with my name burned on their heart. Nothing wrong with t-shirts. We may do some sometime. Well, I just have to say those things because then one day I'll have a t-shirt. Like, we'll be doing a fundraiser and you guys will be like, I thought you said no (laughs) t-shirts. So I just want to make sure we're clear there's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is, is all that stuff is a tool that's supposed to bring people to him. We're not building a candlestick, we're building a kingdom. And that kingdom is about the fire and the flame. Hmm. I gotta close. We have more time than I thought and I still gotta close. (laughs) Um, I can do it. It says, Make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. That, grac- that word gracious there means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior. 
That means the Lord is saying, I want to come down to where you are so that I can raise you up to where I am. It's the promise of the word becoming flesh, being said in a blessing thousands of years before it actually happened. It's Jesus becoming a man. It's, it's the greater coming down and kneeling down and stooping down to the level of the inferior. It's God saying, I will bring myself down to your level so that you can understand me and you can know me, and I'll give you an example that you can actually follow, and then I'll give you a command that's doable, and I'll tell you to follow me. But, he, it, but to, the, to the people of Israel, this would have been an incredible thing to hear that, the, that Yahweh, the name they wouldn't even say, would promise that he was actually going to bring himself down and stoop down to their level. That, that he wasn't distant. That he wasn't far away. He was coming for them. And he'd be with them. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. This is the thing he says twice, same word for countenance and his face. When it says his face shine on you and his countenance towards you, it's the same word. It's the thing he says twice. Why? I think it's the thing that he wanted to make sure they knew if they didn't know anything else, that they knew that his desire was for his face to shine on them, that he's looking at them, that no matter where they've gone, what they've done, they've never been outside of the watchful, loving eyes of the Father. I I felt that when I was writing this down, and I I just wanna, wanna say this to you. No matter how you feel, no matter what you've done, no matter what lie you've believed, you've never been outside of the watchful, loving eyes of the Lord. You were never unloved. The cross wasn't his way to love you, it was the revelation of his love for you. He came because he loved you, not so that he could. The cross didn't make you lovable. It proved you were always loved. For God so loved the world, not so that God could love the world, he sent his son. Before you did the first thing right, before the children of Israel did anything right, in fact, they did a lot of things wrong, and he said, I want you to know that my eyes will never be off you. And I don't want you to be afraid that I see everything. See, that, that thought of God seeing everything we do either fills us with fear or fills us with hope. And we're either filled with fear because we're living in a way that we know he's called us not to or we're filled with hope because we believe that every circumstance we find ourselves in, he sees and he cares. Like it's the most comforting thing in the world to know that there's nowhere I can go that God doesn't see me. It used to scare me. It used to terrify me. Listen, if, if, that, if when I say that, it, it actually brings fear into your life, like don't ignore that. Get alone with him today. Say, God, what am I doing that the thought that you see everything actually causes fear? Let your perfect love come and cast it out. Bring repentance, bring forgiveness. So that when we hear that, rather than any fear, we actually go, oh, thank you, God. I'm so thankful, Father, that no matter where I go and what I do, you see. That there's nowhere I could go that your eyes aren't on me and that you're not looking. And then he says this, and give you peace. Obviously, that word there, everyone knows, is shalom. So this is what he's saying. All of these things I've said to you, Let the place of blessing, my protection, my grace, my eyes on you, let it do two things. Let it set you on fire, and let it give you peace, shalom, safety, well-being, happiness, health, prosperity, peace, to be made whole. So I wanna do this real quick, the thing's flashing at me angrily, letting me know that I'm over time. But he says, so they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and then I will bless them. He says, this is what I want to do, but I need people who actually hear and believe when I speak, that they'll actually speak this over people, and then I'll do it. 
And what an amazing time right now for us to stand in that place. Because this was to Aaron and his sons, the original priests of God's people, but now we are all of a royal priesthood. This isn't anymore just for a special person, a pastor, a special man, an evangelist, or missionary. This is no longer reserved for just special people who held a place in an office of priest back in the Old Covenant. This is now something that every single believer who is a part of the royal priesthood can actually declare and believe God and watch him do it. So I want to do this real quick. I want everyone just to stand. And we're going to put the verses. Can we put all of them up on the screen? We'll just start at, 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 at the first one, and we're just going to go through, and we're going to read it together, but, but not just read it. Yet go to the next, the next slide. Right here. All right, so it, we're going to start together at the next slide, but, but this is what I want us to hear the Lord saying today. Wait, go back one slide, Stan. Sorry. Actually, you know what? I've got it on paper here in front of me. It might be easier instead of you trying to read my mind. He says, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, but, but I want us to say this to the people of the world, to the children of God, to the sons and daughters of God, that right now may be tempted to be gripped with fear, that right now may be tempted to be gripped with uncertainty, that right now may have someone in their life that just started with a dry cough, and the enemy's trying to come in like a flood. And that, that this isn't to minimize what they're going through. This is to say that, like, this is something that God cares about. And he sees. And he would call us to stand in that place and declare his heart over them and believe that he will do what he said he would do if we will do what he asked us to do. He said, this is how I want you to bless my people. You shall say to them, let's say this together, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace and give you shalom and give you well-being and happiness and safety and health and protection and provision. So Father, we just pray, just begin to say your own prayer over the people who are struck with fear, over the people who have, who have come down with an illness, over the people who are panicking, over the people who are purveying the fear. They're not the enemy, they've been gripped by the enemy. They've given their mouth and their voice to another and we don't wanna do that in this day. God, we wanna give our mouth, our voice to you. We wanna declare what you say, God. We wanna believe what you believe. Jesus, we believe that your name is greater than that of COVID-19. It has to bow to the name of Jesus. It must bow to your name. Your name is greater than every other name. And this is just another Goliath in the valley that is trying to intimidate and trying to strike fear and trying to, to, to control the narrative. But God, we, are, we will say that we'll be the Davids who will believe that we have a greater covenant. And we'll look at this thing and say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would taunt the army of the living God? What is this disease that is not from you, God, that it would try to taunt and strike fear in the armies of the living God? Father, we thank you for healing. We thank you for cure. God, we thank you that, that in every way that you heal and in every way that you cure, that you're moving in the hearts of men. God, no enemy has ever put it in the heart of a man to come up with something that preserves life because the enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy. So God, we trust you and we thank you that you're putting it in the hearts and minds of men. But Father, beyond that, we thank you for your promise of protection. We thank you for your promise that you watch over your word. We thank you that your eyes are upon your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We love you guys. Listen, hey, listen, just go love people where they, if God could stoop down and 